Our mission statement here, uh, grounded by our history, one of the oldest publicly supported schools in Wisconsin, Fair Point School District is the heart of a small community that educates and inspires our students for a bright future in a big world. Okay, Uji, hi, big call. Bush, here. Don, here. Harris, here. Mason, here. here. Metcalf, here. here. Johnson, here. Selby, here. Hey, Mitch, we'll start with recognitions. So we have uh, some successful students and advisors that uh, the recipient of a grant, I'm gonna turn it over to Danny Robb, our school social worker, and all the spokespeople. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> all right, so we... <laughs> we, so our middle school um, had an opportunity. So we actually, I went to student council, or actually Mr. Miles, at student council had asked students on the student council um, committee whether or not they were interested in applying for this grant. And four students stepped up and said, I would love to do this. So they actually came and had lunch with me. So we have Harvard. You want to, you want to say your name? This is Blake. And, and then Rachel Heisner as well, and she's at volleyball practice. Um, so we came together, and you guys had some amazing ideas. And so what they did is they submitted their ideas to this grant. So it's through the Packer Foundation. And um, from there, they selected 20 applicants. So it's 20 middle schools in the state of Wisconsin who present their idea. Yeah, no. So they put together a presentation and they presented their idea. Um, and then they actually asked questions of the students as well. So it's kind of fun. Um, responses. And then from there, they selected 13 uh, schools in the state of Wisconsin to receive $500. So they all get like had practice and are tired and it's Monday, but anybody want to share any parts of the idea of what you guys talked about? You will? Do you want to talk? Do you want to read this part or no? Okay. Oh, why didn't we see the first part? So the last year shows only seven. What's business first? About one hundred percent of students. So kind of the, one of the first things that they talked about that they wanted to do was to uh, start a kindness club at the middle school okay. and. Any of you want to share the three ideas of things you wanted to do for the kindness club? You don't have to read all that now. Oh, uh, we put together welcome kits for every new student to Monroe Point Middle School during November 9th. We want to create a weekly shout outs for students uh, by others being kind. Money from the grant will be used to purchase prizes for students who give a shout out. And we want to put inspiring quotes on the bathroom stall to remind our classmates that they're amazing and keep giving. And so it's amazing because this is all, these are all their ideas, which is pretty cool. Um, and so with the kindness club, we put a survey out to students before break to see if people would like to be part of it. We have students that are interested. So our next step is to get the group together and carry out some of these great ideas. Um, the next one was um, a game club. You want to talk about that? Um, so we'll have our first one the last Tuesday of this month. We've got it already scheduled and ready to go with it. And then our last thing that they wanted to do was community service projects. Mm -hmm. We want to start creating up community service projects with the following ideas that we have from 2022 to 2022. 
and cards from the nursing home, volunteering at the winter food pantry, hanging up around the community, without visiting an animal or gather items, slash volunteer for the community society, and on other mission. Well, those are some of their ideas that they came up with and our goal is to do at least a couple uh, community service projects for $500 that we do. Great job, Jasper. Thank you. Well, while not here or are part of the board and packet, um, would like to recognize Allison Keller at the elementary music for her first elementary winter holiday musical performance and her choreographer, Tom Ingwell, who uh, devoted a lot of PE time to helping kids learn the proper steps and techniques for that uh, excellent program. And also then uh, another, I guess, a shout out to Mr. Nevers and Ms. Calderon McHugh for their winter holiday program that was on the evening of the 12th of December. So a lot of, a lot of great things that happened here just recently. So a lot of good things to be proud of as a pointer. Okay, thank you. All right, next we'll do approval of the minutes. Um, I'll take a motion to approve the Joint Finance Personnel Committee meeting on December 7th. Uh, and the regular meeting from last month um, together or separately. I move to approve the minutes of the last regular meeting as well as the joint finance personal committee meeting uh, together. Your motion? A second. Any discussion or comments in the minutes? Vanessa? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Felding? Yes. Bush? Yes. Harris? Yes. Eisner? Yes. Done. Yes. Okay, next is communications. Uh, we'll start with board communications received. Uh, let's go reverse order with Andy. I received a couple. Um, a couple people reached out with concern about having the elementary concert on the early release day. Um, and it seemed like it created additional congestion. I don't, I wasn't there, but that was their concern. And I just expressed that probably had something to do with the calendar and the way the break fell and, and stuff like that. And probably wasn't an annual thing that they were switching to, but that I would pass it along. And I had three recently retired teachers reach out about the retirement package. Concerns expressed about if it's a you know a thank you, they would have appreciated the thank you, et cetera. So that's what I received. Okay. Uh, I got an anonymous letter that was shared um, that basically just showed um, concerns about any kind of uh, Retirement package for teachers and whether we can afford these times, uh, basically, uh, the spirit of it. That was all I got. <clears throat> so, I also, I'm not sure if I'm referencing the Save Anonymous letter, but I um, received a letter, I actually received it secondhand from a former board member, but it was received anonymously, that individual. Um, and I think that they expressed some some concerns and we're really looking to stimulate conversation, which I think that letter will do. And um, we have some of those topics on the agenda tonight and in coming months. But there were three things that I out of that letter that I wanted to touch on because I was reflecting on um, on my communications and particularly the summary I gave or the, the recap of the Joint Finance and Personnel Committee meeting that I thought um, perhaps were unclear. And so I thought this would be a good opportunity to clarify. Um, the first one was that I had mentioned some potential insurance changes that we as a district are considering, um, but we didn't have a lot of details yet. And I still don't have a lot of details. But what I am, what I would like to clarify is that um, those potential insurance changes are intended for um, employees of the district, not for retirees. 
and that that change, that insurance change is looking at um, providing an option that is less cost to the district. So it is not going, it is something that will save the district money um, with hopefully very minimal impact to the benefit that our employees receive. But it is not, we're not looking at enhancing an offering at the expense of the district. It's not sweetening the pot. It is a cost saving measure for us as a district. Um, the second one or a second topic I wanted to touch on was around the um, the retirement option that we'll be discussing tonight. Um, that that we are not intending to provide insurance in retirement. Um, if when we discuss that, it'll become clearer. Um, we are looking at potentially having an option where if that is approved, the money could be used it, uh, to purchase health insurance outside of what the school offers in a tax protected account. Um, but we as a district would not be looking at providing insurance to the retirees. And then there was a comment that these individuals are likely to retire anyway. And that is true. But when we look at the population of teachers that we're targeting, many of these folks could teach easily teach another five to 10 years. And the package that we'll be discussing tonight if implemented and everyone accepted it, would save the district up to $100,000 a year for the next three years, which could, amongst other things, help us uh, not have to go to referendum or have to go to referendum for a smaller amount. And so, yes, those teachers would potentially retire, but we're looking for cost-saving measures in the here and now and not waiting five or 10 years to realize those cost savings. So um, and I, I would love to have a conversation. If, if there is somebody out there who would like to discuss these items uh, more, please feel free to call me or, or email me. I'd love to have the dialogue and talk through the concerns, um, but hopefully I hit the key items and we'll discuss that in more detail this evening. Thank you. Question on that. So when I read it, it read like it came from a former Board member. No, so a former school board member had received it in the mail anonymously, and and okay. the individual who sent the letter was looking to to stimulate some conversation around some of these topics, and um, unfortunately, they didn't feel comfortable reaching out to one of us directly, and so they kind of took an indirect route. But I'm I'm happy to have the conversation, and hopefully, the information shared um, at least gives some perspective. I feel better that a former school board member didn't find an anonymous letter appropriate. Oh, yes. Received them. And just a reminder, you know, uh, we all have school emails and our phone numbers are all posted on the school website uh, under the board members tab if anyone wants to reach out to us. Okay, next is citizen communications. Anyone signed up on that? No. Okay, anyone online who would like to uh, use their three minutes for a public comment, you can use your raise the hand icon. And we will call on you. Going once, going twice. I don't see any, Mitch. No? Nope. Okay, no hands. great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on to uh, items for information and discussion. First is the budget update. So you have um, in your board packet or online comparisons again, December of 21 at this time. Last year when we were looking at the December budget, we had expanded 39.32% of our budget. This year in December of 22, we had gone through 42.54% our budget. Again, nothing nothing necessarily jumping out like why we really seem to be far ahead here or there. I would, uh, I would assume some of the uh, fuel purchases would kind of factor into this with gas that had bounced up a little high, then come back down and kind of starting to creep back up again. But I, I think budgetarily, we're in, a, we're in a good shape. We're closing in on halfway through the school year halfway through the fiscal year, so I think we're in pretty good shape. Yeah, usually we're within two or three percentage points of the year prior. Right, so yeah, from year to year. Um, 
see any major concerns with us trending off budget. Any other comments or questions about the budget update? Just to dig in a little deeper, on line four of this year's budget, it is the non-capital objects. Um, we're over budget already. Is there is that the fuel expense or is there? There would be some, excuse me, some of the pre-purchase things. Oh. So we'll, re we'll reflect the negative budget there for a while because of things that we had to pre pre-purchase to try to help keep this balance, this budget balanced. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Um, next, I have building administrator reports on the agenda. Yeah, we'll we'll table that. I shared in my update. It's been 11 school days since the last report out, so there hasn't been a lot of things going on in the buildings other than preparing for some of the holiday festivities within each building and then coming back from break. So that will return as a, an agenda item in February then. I know one of the things we were talking about is uh, star data in February. So that's one of the things that'll be on the report out for the February meet, administrative report out. That sounds okay with me unless anyone has any specific building related questions. Since we're on, we got it on the agenda right now. No, okay. Next is school board election timeline. Um, we have three candidates that have filled out the paperwork uh, to be on the ballot in April. Uh, Andrew M. Bush, Joni L. Heisner, and Alan Schrank. Those of you that just came on this year, you might want, if you would be willing to speak, we're looking at trying to do the same thing in lieu of the candidate form is have the media class conduct the interviews and then post those interviews online, at least on the school website. The, the paper may have an additional questionnaire they would send out, but anybody that would like to talk on the experience they had with the student interviews. It was, I mean, it was really good. They were very kind because I was very nervous. <laughs> I think what they um, you know, it was really easy. We came in, sat down, had the interview. I mean, lasted 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, it was a great experience and fun to interface with the kids, you know, which is the reason why you're going to do this in the first place. And, uh, so it really brings that home. Um, you get the questions in advance. So, you know, you have the opportunity to be very well prepared. Um, I think we had a list of like... Uh, questions or something like that and then they just chose um five or six of them you could watch the video uh having and sort of preparing for the eventuality um i had watched previous meetings you know of the board interviews and uh they can be very political when there's community members asking questions and I don't know if you went through that, Joni. Andy definitely did a few times. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, that's an interesting outlet for the community to come in and kind of say what they got to say and ask what they want to ask. And, and you see sort of where the community is. So this takes away that opportunity. Um, they can send in questions, but I noticed that the political questions were all filtered out um, in the interview process. So that's sort of the give and take of it, I guess, which is worth mentioning it but, but uh i thought it was a great process we've had conversations here where if you are you know some years we've had only enough candidates for the seats available and other years we've had double you know so you have six people answering the same question if you're not the first you might be answering it the same way as you know right. another board member or all five other board members and and then all of a sudden you're Sometimes you might feel caught like, well, you know, what am I going to say? They, they just said everything that I was going to say. We're here. You can say what you need to say or want to say and how you would address that issue or answer that question and not worry about what somebody else said. Even though it might be repeated, you're not in that same room, you know, so it doesn't necessarily look like you're just copying 
this person's answer in there, you know, so it kind of, I think, helps a little bit with some of those things. This is a really good point. A really good point. None of us were in the room with each other, so we were just doing our own thing. So, did they put any like the Q and A in the paper, like this? Um, they did like our our bios. I feel like yeah, I think they, they did the paper. bios. Yeah. Um, but no, I I was expecting them to have our questions in the paper, and they didn't. And I I'm wondering if it was because it was just a little. I don't know. <clears throat> It was really cool to see their space down there and the process that they were. Get students a little bit involved in oh, an yeah. in upcoming Great. election as well. So I would say as a candidate in the upcoming election, I feel like it's maybe less intimidating or safer than sitting in front of a, a room full of people and having not knowing what that next question is going to be. I was on the panel the year we were asked if you had to stop funding music or sports, which would it be? There's no right answer to that. Right. You know. So I'm fine with the approach. Was there a was there a sense that maybe having something as nerve-wracking as a community forum might deter people from running? Was that part of the discussion? Uh, and it never came up in any of the discussions we had, you know, and it was kind of looking at what we've come through, you know, how can we still try to provide some of this information to the voters without necessarily gathering as a whole and, you know, we're kind of past that, but it's like, this, I think, helps wrap in some of the things that do, that are happening here at school, you know, the, the student media program and things and, and another way for us to tap into to that and still be able to get that message out to the community. We were, we were hoping that would be something that we could continue as we went down the road. I think a lot of people watched it. I don't remember how many years it had. You could look it up, but it was over 100, I think. So people looked at it. I know we've never had, we've never had 100 in here at any one time, but that's not to say how many have watched you know, watched any of those recordings. But you know, it's nice to know that people are at least trying to find out that information somewhere. Well, thank you to the three candidates. Uh, put your names forward. Um, any other comments about? Well, we held our timeline? drawing of lots and presentation Friday. Yes. So the actual order that rolled here on the ballot, Andrew Pam Bush, Shrank and Joni L. You should have received your letters. Okay. Can we move on then? Okay. We'll go to the action agenda. First is approval of open enrollment seats. So we, the admin team met uh, to discuss kind of the open enrollment numbers. We had a couple of different options uh, I shared with the board and included administrators today that at this point in time, not knowing what might happen with any retirement benefits, if there are any retirement retirements that would go along with those benefits, we're comfortable recommending option A, which maintains the current number of sections at the elementary school, and then the numbers that are associated with it. So you have the enrollments. We basically kind of rolled the numbers forward. We're looking at kindergarten next year being in the neighborhood of 39 students. Um, dropped off the seniors to the far right. You have what your board policy recommendations are, what the administration recommendations would be for a max in any of those grade levels. So you kind of see uh, in that yellow column, kind of in the middle, kind of where, where they would be based on open enrollment numbers. Our policy, you, you worked on the policy, we've had the two readings, so we will apply all of those. So if a section is closed according to policy, if they have a sibling that's 
already attending this year in school, then they would be accepted in to a grade level that might be closed off. That would be following our policy. So just, just to be clear, uh, we're going on the premise that there'll be two third grade classes next year, but that's not your that's not your final recommendation for next year because you're for staffing a lot for staffing because there's a lot of contingencies with retirements and um and, I, and maybe we, a potential to change that staffing arrangement right third grade. we have to we have to make this recommendation based on our current situation and if that's what if nothing changes between now and the start of next school year those numbers are unfortunately set at this point in time in January. So I, I don't have I don't have the flexibility to say if then, you know, if we hire, then we could allow X number of more. That number has to be set. We can't amend it later. No. Okay. So we have gone through about or by the end of the year, somewhere between 60 and 75% of the year having three or two and a half teachers at that second grade level. Is there any reason to think that that same group of kids won't continue to need more than two teachers in when they move into third grade? And if that's the case, wouldn't it make sense to open that grade up to open enrollment so that there is at least a chance we could bring in some students to help uh, offset the cost of having an additional section, which is option B. <laughs> it's not, it wasn't an agenda item tonight to, to bring forward and, you know, what, what would be our recommendation for staffing next year at the elementary school? Had that been an action item, we would have tried to time that out as that's the first thing, which would then maybe give a little bit more flexibility to the open enrollment. I'm just not comfortable right now, as, as much as I would love to say yes, I, I think there needs to be a commitment to that, getting that third section back in there to help address the needs of those students. You know, we, we took some measures this year, you know, and it was a temporary measure to try to help those students be more successful in the classroom, especially in the area of reading, you know, the wise recommendation would be to say, yep, we're going to we're going to hire a third teacher so that each grade level has three sections. But without that being an action item, I, I can't say if we hire three, then this is our open enrollment because I don't know where the budget's going to come from out of Madison, what kind of support we would get out of Madison. So that, and this is this is exactly option B is exactly where we were coming at it from the admin team when we'd met. Uh, last week that, you know, this would be the recommendation coming forward, but because I don't have that staffing component, because I don't know those numbers yet, what, what what's the budget impact? Go back to option A and let's say, this is our current, this is our current situation. This is what we know we have in our building. These are the open enrollment numbers that we can support based on the number of teachers and a number of sections. Now you can certainly, this is our recommendation. You could you can set that number somewhere different if you choose. I go back to I think it's optimistic to think that if that if that group of students needed or would have been better served by three sections this year, they wouldn't also be better served by three sections next year. And if that's the case, if we're going to end up there anyway, let's not limit our opportunity to have open enrollment students, which bring in additional revenue to help offset that. I doubt that we will bring in enough students in that third grade class to fully pay for that teacher. I think it would be unrealistic to expect that. But even if we had two or three, it would help offset the cost of that teacher. Again, we, you know, we were two months into the school year this year and decided we needed to find a way to provide more support. I would go out on a limb and say that if you act, if, 
the open enrolled students, students were in that grade level with two sections, it would probably break that grade level. So the students don't necessarily have to come in there. They could come in anywhere else and still help offset that cost. You know, it isn't a, it isn't a direct, this third grade open enrolled student impacts the third grade budget. It, it impacts the, the district budget. So uh, there could be students, you could have a sixth grader, you could have eight fifth graders, 10 fourth graders come in and not one third grader come in. That would offset that cost of an additional staff member if you could hit those numbers. You could pick up two additional 15 kindergartners. You know, that, that number is the hard number. Uh, Angie, I don't know if you or Matt, you would like to speak to kind of that kindergarten number, but you have stu some students that weren't in our preschool that may choose to attend kindergarten next year, you know, so they're not necessarily on our radar as well. And again, I come back to love open enrollment. I love people wanting to be here. It, it's, a, it's a benefit for other students. It's a benefit for our students. It helps our budget. Um, well, if we could have places for families to move in here, then it helps a lot of other things as well. It helps the community, the county, the city, and the school district if people could move here as well. Which expense would we have to find? Which expense would we have to find if we went with the option? Probably on the low side, fifty thousand. That would be a that would be a first year teacher with all the benefits rolled in. You know some you know alternative benefits or an, or an insurance option. That would be the dental insurance, the health insurance, the social security tax, the retirement, all of that would, would, would be about $50,000. And that's for a first year teacher. Yeah, no. <laughs> I was here, we wanna hire the best, I agree. And the thought that if not as many teachers as fire as potential, that there's flexibility and giving coverage without adding another teacher. I would I no, I, I wouldn't say that's the case. It would be the impact on the budget. Would give would we would have more flexibility with the budget if there were a larger number of retirees that took advantage of a potential offering. What when the year closes out, what is it going to have cost us to provide additional support at that second grade level? I, I don't have that number before me, I, but I could look. Well, what are we? What are we paying Maddie on a daily basis? Two is it two ten? What are we? Two hundred. We have a first year teacher. So about three. that's about but you're talking about twenty twenty one thousand. And that's just for half the year. Correct. Right. Yeah. And the long term sub pay is. Thank you. Okay. So you're looking at 42 for if, if we hired a long term sub for a one year contract for next year to teach third grade, you're looking at like 42 ish. Yeah, somewhere in there. So we would have to give that long term sub a break five days and then. <laughs> Okay. We'd have to, so to meet the definition of long-term sub. Yeah. So I get a question on uh, the seventh grade. So there's no spots available, but there's only 50 kids in that class. I was just wondering what's going on there. That that hits the maximum capacity based on on the board recommendations or on the board guidelines and administrators that it would be 25 per section because there's like two sections. Okay. And in eighth grade, we've got 63 and uh, sixth grade, we've got 59. We have three sixth grade oh, teachers, see, three yeah. sixth grade classrooms, and then only... Does it make sense to apply those guidelines to middle school? Classroom sizes are still... the still the same so if you have 25 or 26 or 27 that, that's a that's a pretty full classroom truly only 
we offer more than two sections of seventh grade math. Yeah, I have one seventh grade math teacher who also teaches eighth yeah, but grade. How many sections do they teach? Vicki? Is that across the board? Are there three sections? With it, yeah. I mean, counting the additional English. Yeah, I mean, it, it generally we we take that amount of students and we split them up into uh, three sections. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think we need to change that number. That yeah. I mean, I, I understand if you don't you know, the staff members and divide them across two grades, it probably is too. But if we have three sections. What do you think about that, Vicki? I mean, there's, there's questions of treating each middle school class as a, a grade that can be split into three sections rather than two sections to accommodate more open and roll students. Because basically, yeah, just come down, come down and spend a day in the classroom. Yeah, no, I want to hear your thoughts about it. Hallway. We're, we are packed in our classroom. Yeah. The, the, the small, obviously we do intervention groups, which are smaller groups, but if you come into a regular class period during the day, you're, you're going to just see the capacity of the classroom. I don't remember for seventh grade. When we talk about this, Two, two staff members. Is that like the homeroom? Homeroom, or are they we splitting the kids up for they all have different sections of sort of the Amy's question, math and science and yeah, the, reading and social you, studies? You have or, your, split them up into sections. And then, so like one section will be in math, one section will be in social studies, and then you have a section in science. It's how our schedule works out during the day because we have our schedule basically. We have to look at the high school schedule before we pretty much schedule our our middle school I sections do. because of the here it's staff. Right. Yeah, we were talking about that the last. Time. And the music, mu the music program, kind of factors in there now mm -hmm. a little bit, right? Because when I first came. Sections. If there was a section of seventh grade in math, the other half was in science, and then they flipped. And the eighth grades were in history and English, and then they flipped. So it was the two sections. It, it basically it, there's only two places to put them at that point in time. There are, I mean, four core teachers. Let's do that by two. Okay, just throw out ideas. Um, one thought, only because I, <clears throat> I did it, the Pakatonic of when I first, before I even started teaching as my intern, they had two interns for a larger grade level that they just felt like wouldn't constitute another section, but there was enough kids and I think enough needs that they wanted to try this. So they hired two interns per semester. Um, That'd be twenty thousand total, no insurance, right? Um, but then, because interns can only teach fifty percent of the day, the other day, the other part of the day, we have to do, you know, other experiences, you know, whatever things happen to do. But so that's what I did with um, another intern. I taught sixth grade. I think I taught, I taught science and literacy in the morning, and he taught uh, math and the social. Studies. It's an intern, do you mean student teacher? Yeah, a student teacher who would get paid. Uh, student teachers don't get paid, but uh, a teacher with similar uh, what Tom has right now with the fire. Because we have one in three sections, you know, he does, he can do two sections. No, two, yeah, two sections of fire for, for every class. We only went to three, that's what we you know, need to do, but it didn't constitute hiring another full time teacher. Does that make sense? And the intern is is what like a college student? Yep, uh, similar to a student, a student teacher, but 
Right. Instead, yeah. instead of their student teaching experience, that is their experience. Okay. Okay. But they're an intern, so they can be alone in the classroom for up to 50% of the day working with students, and they receive pay for that. And what, what I really liked about it is <clears throat> I had a, another person to just to share the classroom. I could bounce ideas off them, or I was going one day, and they could cover for, you know, one day. And just an idea, I don't think it's perfect, but... So, Andy, are you suggesting that we add another staff in middle school? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, I'm suggesting that if there's three sections, our class sizes are wrong. So if there's not 25 kids in a grade math class, if there's three sections. And to be clear, uh, I would prefer a third teacher on the record. But I really have our friends. How many of our open enrollment slots do we fill? Do we fill 75% of them? We fill fifty percent of them. In terms of new ones from year to year, yeah. I don't know that I have that number. <clears throat> um, you probably deny a handful a year, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, probably no more than five in any in any given year would be denied. Um, and, and some of those denials have been uh, in, in this scenario, we might add a first grader, a fourth grader, and an eighth grader. And we have to deny the eighth grader, and then it's up to the family to choose do you want to send the other two students without the eighth grader or not? We, we've been in that situation in the past. What if we looked at option B? And we put twos in line 29 and 30. Twos or threes in there. You see what grade that is? Uh, seventh grade and eighth grade. The three in there? Um, nope, not in the staffing, in the open enrollment. We added a kid or two to, to every section. Thinking out loud with. Yeah. If that is enough, because we aren't going to get 12 third graders, we're probably not going to get 10 fourth graders. And we really, second grade at 61 kids, that there's not a lot of wiggle room there. Um, is that enough for us to say, man, if we could fill most, at least 50% of those slots, is it enough for us to feel like we could commit to a third grade teacher for next year. That's an interesting strategy. It's a gamble. How many slots do we usually have? Uh, from year to year, uh, if I go back, if I just go back to last year, we would have had <laughs> 20, 30, 40, 50, mid fifties. We said we would have had, that's just, that's just in the levels where section count is important, student count's important because we have no limits for high school. Sure. So this would have been last year and you're looking at, like I said, 20, 30, 40, 50, 55, 58, 59. We had 59 seats basically in the kindergarten through eighth grade level. <laughs> And we don't know how many of those we filled. Our open enrollment numbers went up. Basically. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of you. Yeah. Now, that's, what's really hard is the number of people that might move into the school district. That obviously they're the residents, so that then trumps the seats that are then available. Mm -hmm. So we can make these numbers have right now, but, but that's the hard part about doing this. Mm -hmm. That brings me back to this third grade class. We have if we have one or two families move in with a move third grader, the we've we've now hit the breaking point, and but, now we're hiring. But then a there's resident district. That's only more money to us 
to begin with. So you can't look at it that way either, Joe. I mean, that's, I mean, and if we had four open enroll students, that would sure help offset the well, would be even better. <laughs> I, but I don't have housing to offer. It's 24 old and old this year. And always better to have a resident. Um, yeah. 34 the year before, 29 the year before. So we've been over 20 and 30 the last two years. And, and, and part of setting the open enrollment numbers are to keep the school district from having to all of a sudden say, well, if we didn't have any limits, then we get this number. Now, now we have to hire new staff person and right now we have a spot at the elementary school where we could put a, another section somewhere because we reduced from three down to two you know but that that's part of the reason why you set that number now yes the other question i have based on our new policy the current tuition waiver students yep. Are they counted in this number next year, or are they automatically placed and we still have this many seats available? It's option. What you just said, option B. They are part of our enrollment, are guaranteed to be here if they, as long as they fill out they the paperwork. Fill. They're I'm not just looking at sixth grade. Yeah, they don't fill the ones. Correct. They're not considered. In, yeah. yeah, that is correct. How many open enrolls do we have to get to make up the? Yes. Let me ask you this. You get about six. Well, no, sorry. It changed now. You're getting about eight per open and roll student. Eight thousand? Yes. Okay. Maybe. So that so now you're talking about six to seven open enrolled students, additional new open enrolled students. Could potentially offset the cost of a brand new first year teacher. So what I'm hearing from you is that, um, you know, if we don't have a lot of retirees this year, and we're looking at a deficit of several hundred thousand dollars, especially if we pay CPI, full CPI, mm -hmm. um, that, and. If we ask you in that situation to present a balanced budget, part of your recommendation would be to not hire a third third grade teacher. Would have to be. We're also dropping so current kids, current resident seniors this year that go to other school districts that we pay, mm -hmm. a large number. Mm -hmm. We won't be paying that next year. That'll affect our net increase. Correct. You know what I'm saying? There's a disproportionate amount of residents in this school district that are seniors that are often rolling out this year. Okay. I don't have that specific number, but it's larger than usual for this class. Okay. I want to say 10. Ooh. Okay. That's interesting. But typically you get you keep them all and, and get a couple that might come in as a junior or senior. That has typically been a large class. Um, so I'd like to make a suggestion. Um, I'm I'm tending towards option B, and uh, for the recommended numbers, um, I think with seventh grade, I was I was thinking more along the lines of five. So you know that you could open enroll mm -hmm. five kids to seventh grade since that number is so small. And then I'd like to suggest that for second grade and eighth grade. We put at least one space available, which would allow, uh, if we have the case where a family wants to come in um, brand new and they have kids across the board, potentially, we could, uh, you know, get one of those spots so that they're not we're not splitting the family. We can get the family in the in the district. Five, I just 
I don't know, I was trying to be, I think 50 is a really low number, so I'm trying to be kind here by not adding too much, but, you know, that would give us seven um, additional spaces. Uh, and uh, I think having, um, I think we should be the school on some level that we want to be. So in the sense of like hiring another staff member for third grade and getting that solidified, we've got a big class, you know, in first grade that's going into second and that'll be going into third. And by being fully staffed um, and, and keeping our great reputation in middle point, we're going to attract more families and more open enrollment, uh, which we need to do to survive over the long term. Like I think we've, got to keep our school fully staffed and well-funded uh, in order for us to bring in lots of kids, which will bring revenue. It's a business decision to me. Like we need to make the place attractive and, and good and maintain our quality of education in order to attract people so that we can keep our numbers up, which is a benefit to the taxpayers because we get more state aid and we should be having to go to referendum as often then. Whereas if our school enrollment numbers drop, we're still paying the facilities and a lot of teachers that we're not utilizing as much. So I beat the dead horse at two meetings ago about wanting to just sort of open up open enrollment. Um, and I see this as sort of a nice middle ground to that. So I think I think I've captured the numbers that you were. I don't have my glasses, Mitch. So, so you said <laughs> you, you said five seats in seventh grade and one seat in second, and one in eighth, and one in eighth. So and that there's no zeros. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I um, this notion of fully staffed in three sections of every grade, I, that that makes me nervous. I don't feel like we can commit, and with knowing that long term enrollment trends are downward that we can commit to three sections. But, and that's my opinion. I, I speak only for myself. But I feel like we would have been, we would have served the students that are currently in second grade and headed to third grade based on the needs of that class to provide them three sections from the beginning. And then we incurred significant additional expense to provide them support throughout the rest of the year. And so based on the fact that the majority of that population is going to continue with us and move into third grade, it makes sense to me to anticipate that we're going to need to continue to serve those students at a higher level. And if we can help offset the cost of that by maximizing our open enrollment, it seems like the fiscally responsible decision. Even though we're spending more money, we are trying to offset the cost by by um, enhancing our open enrollment opportunities. I think another way of saying what you're saying, if I understand, is uh, given the experiences we've had with this grade this year and the struggles of meeting their needs with just two full-time teachers, I think we appreciate the needs that will be created as a third grade class in the sense that if we need to make budget cuts, um, uh, you know, uh, not hiring a third, extra third grade teacher would probably be lower on the list of things we would turn to as far as levers to pull or cost savings. Right, I mean, that we, we would not be excited to make that decision if we had to. You know I, what I mean? I would agree with that. The potential there's some other levers we would have to pull, but I think at some point who in the future is going to have to pay the money. Don't give them the staff or the staff right now to make go further and further along in the middle school and help that for you. I feel like I feel like next year we're going to pick from two, three, one of three options. One, the good option is hire a couple interns, like Matt suggested. The better option is come up with a long term sub solution that's a temporary solution. And then the best option would be to hire a full time teacher. 
yeah, I feel like we were, we're going to be choosing one of those options unless we're really up against it. Budget. The other thing that comes to mind, and I think we've had this discussion before, and sometimes the changing of teams and grade levels sometimes creates some new learning and some, some new teams over year one into our new curriculum. And unless we happen to get a retirement in the grade level, new teachers, we're talking about creating a new team at grade level, moving teachers around and asking them to learn the curriculum again at a new grade level when they have just gotten grasp of, you know, the, the concepts for their grade level. So I think that's something we may need to consider as well. It may help us not have to shuffle multiple times in the next three years on top of the fact that we've identified the needs are there, this, this group. Can I ask a question based on that? Matt, how, how much would you say that the system of the curriculum itself is consistent from grade level to grade level? Very good. It spirals. So um, comes back to, it has similar language, what they call an active conversation, one strategy in first grade is basically the same routine in fifth grade. Um, it allows us to, because they keep touching on the same standard strategy skills, the teachers don't have to spend days on teach one skill because some kids need it because they know they'll see it again and again and again. Having these conversations, though, I want to say that as we look at the class that's going into kindergarten at 39 students, that in my mind, if if that class doesn't grow significantly by the time it's you know looking at second or third grade, that that's another class where it's ripe for the opportunity of considering two sections. That at a section of nineteen and a section of twenty is reasonable. Um, I'm not, I don't want us to move away from the idea at all that we would ever go less than three sections. It just happens that that particular class that's going into third grade. Um, is resource intensive and needs the supports that we ran into this year. And out of these 50 something open enrollment slots, you think that we need seven to eight to cover a new teacher? Right, yeah, brand new brand teacher. New. Yeah, seven to eight new open enrollees in would get, would cover a brand new, full time brand new teacher. And we have open enrollment slots now looking at this option B <coughs> with Bill and Joni's updated numbers that you guys suggested. We have a slot open in every grade level. Correct. We're saying we can just drive around. We can recruit elementary kids. And get <laughs> <We're sure. laughs> no they can't recruit high school kids. That's, that's not, that doesn't help us, right? Who says that? <laughs> <laughs> Now you got to know the system. And we're getting, and we typically in open enroll how many students per year? It's been in the 20s. In the 20s, 30s. Averaging in the 20s the last three years. That's a net positive, right? Correct. Well, Mitch, this is more aggressive than what you brought to us after hearing our conversation. Are you like, yeah, let's do this? Or are you like, oh, guys, A, let's go A? Where are you at? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, tell us why this is a bad idea. Because <laughs> you're going to come to me and tell me I want a balanced budget by the end of May. And you're taking away of your most of my, most of the biggest pots of money. You're, you're taking that away mm -hmm. as, a, as options. And, and and I hate, I truly, I want everybody that watches this at some point down the road, I hate talking about school in terms of dollars. I hate that. It's not me as an educator. And I know it's not necessarily all of you is what, why you're here, but it's something that we have to do. And, you know, in our retreats, we talk about fiscal responsibility and, that, and that's, I'm trying to maintain that to the best of my ability. 
if you if you would guarantee at least one, you you, you tend to catch that family that might bring three students here with an open role. And, and now they all get to come in because there's at least that one seat. It, it does make sense. And I know we've talked about that in the past, that we want to at least try to be able to capture multiple families, you know, multiple children out of a family. It makes sense to me to kind of look at that as far as setting our open enrollment numbers now. Um, you know, would we get anybody in, in the seventh grade? It's hard to say we would get anybody in the seventh grade. You know, some years it's like, we know this, we know this grade is closed. And the next thing you know, we have five families that move in and all five families have a student in that closed off grade level. That's like, we, we have to add those five students because they're now ours. They live in our district. So it, the enrollment thing is, is it, it's, you know, if anybody could predict it, they should be picking the lottery numbers for tomorrow night. Open and roll in August. I like a motion that we approve option B currently presented in special ed numbers that were presented. Yeah. If you haven't had a chance to look, Angie, you want to address the, the special ed numbers? Yeah, so look at potential caseloads, um, our staffing, where we contract with, um, and the one kind of big change this year is our speech program is at capacity with our staffing limits. So unless we want to spend more money to hire more speech teachers, which there are none to be hired. Um, I'm recommending that we close the speech and language program. That's different than we've never done that before. Everything else is um, kind of the same philosophy as the last several years. Anything that we would incur through a contract, those programs are closed just because of the new cost to the district. We don't have the staff for them. So those would be things like OT, PT, vision, hearing. We would contract out for a teacher with, but... Um, so just to explain the speech numbers, uh, ASHA, which is the speech program's national, you know, license or their national organization, they recommend about 35 per caseload, which is about what most of the districts around here do. I ran our numbers with 30 to 40 or 35 to 40 as the range, and we are at the top of the capacity right now with our current staffing. So. You really don't have the capacity to take on more students to language needs unless you want to extend the contract of our point three person. And I'm not sure Iowa Grant would be able to give us any more speech because speech numbers are exploding everywhere. Those are the numbers. As amended, Andy. Yes. Do yes. oh. a motion, do have a second? Second. Bruce Johnston, any other comments or discussion? Bob, any thoughts? I'm just looking at that seventh and eighth, excuse me, seventh and eighth grade. If, let's just say, if we got five seventh graders and one eighth grader, is that, is it really doable? You know, is the is there enough room, you know, physically, and then for the class sizes is it doable? Whenever I see like a number like that, you know, the the thirty two and the, the twenty eight say, um, you know, together for just those two areas, is that doable? It's it's doable. Can we get some new lockers? I mean, our lockers. Or 
terrible. And we can't even get the parts to fix the lockers anymore. They're so old. 46. Mm -hmm. So, so is it is it quality of lockers or number of lockers for both? No, just quality. They're they're so old that you, you can't get the parts to fix them anymore. I think member Bush's name is carved in one. Some of those lockers <laughs> came over from the That's the wrong. Okay. That's the wrong. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not doubting that it says that. It's <laughs> just not my first. Okay, sorry. I remember how many lockers we did get for like our eighth grade wing, and then we were going to get more, but because of the budget, we never finished ordering uh, lockers because money. More like estimated cost for one hallway. And we were going to look. Oh, it looks like that. Yeah, 63 and 56. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else want to make a comment on the current motion or? Is anything different? Okay. One question. Yes. 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 Uh, next is approval of WASBI resolutions. You have a Spence Association of School Board representative, a WASB representative, which is member Heisner. Um, a year ago, prior to the WASB convention, you typically authorize your representative to vote on your behalf at the convention. There are the bring many, many possible potential resolutions before the conference, and uh, they'll vote on whether or not you give WASB the authority to move forward with any of those or so on and so forth. So basically, you would need to give your representative that authority to, to vote in the best interest of the Middle Point School District. I move that we give WASB delegate, Joni Heisner, and Middle Point School Board member, Joni Heisner, uh, authority to uh, vote as she sees fit in the best interest of the Middle Point School District. Here we have a motion. Second. Okay, Jeanetteka Skelding, any other comments, discussion? Um, so I have read through all of the um, all of the language proposed, and if there's anything you would like to discuss or have me carry forward, um, we can, as delegates, we have an opportunity to make comments and try and influence other delegates. So if there is anything you want called out, otherwise I didn't see anything that I found to be particularly controversial or something that I would take a very strong stand um, against. Everything's pro-education, you know, going reading through that as well. It's, you know, it makes sense that WASB conference is going to be pro-education. So yeah, I didn't think anything in there was crazy either. Anybody else? Angie? Yes. 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 Okay. Next is Google part time afternoon elementary instructional assistant. This is a position you post. You gave us authority to post. We've had it posted. For what seems like forever for a school district. Um, it is a 15 hour a week position. It's part time afternoons, four days a week. We finally have a candidate, a viable candidate that is interested in the position. Um, I recommend that you approve the hire of Maddie Chapman. Um, you can certainly table it. There is closed session if you wish to discuss it. It's uh, 
it's a it's it's a needed position. It's if it's approved, we'll move into district flow through money. So it ends up right now we're paying a variety of different people, including Maddie, who's done it through the sub uh, budget line. This would go into flow through money, so it would save money in the fund ten budget. It's the same Maddie that's the second grade. No, it's a different Maddie. Okay, that's Maddie Flanders. Okay, <laughs> Member Bush and I had that same conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which Maddie is? How many Maddies do we have? Okay. This right. Maddie Chapman is different. Maddie Flanders is right now currently helping in the second and fifth grade reading positions. Okay, just to be clear, this is not a new position. This was a position that was resigned. Well, no, this one was new oh, due to a student enrolling coming into our district. Yeah, got it. We've had it posted now several months. October, I think. Okay. Well, uh, anyone has a right to um, make a motion to table this until after closed session, if you'd like. Otherwise, I'll take a motion to uh, approve the hiring as presented. I'll make a motion to approve the hiring as presented. Okay. Any discussion questions? Harris? Yes. Eisner? Yes. Janetka? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Galvin? Bush? Yes. John? Yes. Thank you. Next is approval of the resignation of Mallory McGuire and posting to uh, for her replacement. Yes, Mallory is works in the high school uh, as an instructional assistant. Her talents and skills will be missed and hopefully she'll just be going from Ross Street to Cawthorn Street while she does her student teaching experience. Uh, she's at that point, she's been a very valuable employee and we hope to see her, you know, Take that next step with regrets, but uh, it is a position that's needed to help support students at the high school. So I would recommend that we regretfully accept her resignation as she takes that next step and then holds that position. Congratulations for taking that next step as well. Yes, absolutely. I'll make a motion to approve the resignation and then post. Second. I'd like to discuss the, the posting. Is there no way that the, mm -hmm. that the duties she was fulfilling can be absorbed by someone else? No, she is supporting students at the high school and at the middle school. We already pulled from her capacity to help cover additional needs at the middle school level. It's supposed to be how many support staff do we have between the three buildings? And do we, do we, either through defined IEPs or other support programs, do we count for all, for all 15 people, for all of the hours that we, we do? And is there any opportunity to provide for, for one individual to support two students at the same time? Or is that outside? And there are some students who have specific needs that require a one-to-one, -one, but most of the high school classes are grouped in a small group of students that are being supported. Just, I'm, I'm speaking out efficiencies. I, I don't mean to badger. No, no I, I understand that. Yeah, and they're all, all of the classes that they support in are driven by IEP. So it's not like I send them to math class just because there's an open hour of the day. Every class they go to is driven by need in an IEP. Okay. Uh, any other discussion, comments, questions? Johnson? Yes. Helding? Yes. Bush? Yes. Eisner? Yes. Harris? Yes. Netka? Yes. Done. Yes.
And next is approval of retirement options. I don't know if Joni or Andy would like to. I think it's your turn, Andy. I feel like I've spoken <laughs> about this a lot. We're out of that joint committee meeting in December. Some of those conversations. I mean, I did share all the notes with the all board members as well. I think specifically to this um, to this item, we're talking about the one-time um, option that was presented to us by Mr. Steger as a cost-saving measure. Um, well, it certainly also serves as a thank you. The motive behind it is the significant cost savings that's always presented to us. Um, and it, it provides uh, essentially for um, there eight teachers. I think on the list it was seven. Seven. I believe there is nine. There's nine. If, if they so choose um, and notify Mitch by March 1st, yeah. Um, to provide, it was presented as $8,000 for insurance. We threw around the idea that they may not need the insurance. We may want to include the cash option as well, while the insurance piece provides them the tax protection we anticipate. Most would take that. It was thrown around to offer both. Since that time, Mitch has met with Liz and Danielle with a representative from DBS, Diversified <clears throat> Benefit Services, I believe is. And the, the cost was year one was $2,000. $2,000. It was a one time $600 setup for it. And then after that, it was X amount per employee or a minimum of if if it's just the eight, even if it's seven, eight, or nine employees, we would have to hit the minimum. So it would be fourteen hundred dollars a year after that to maintain that. A lot of flexibility. The, the district can pick a lot of how they want to handle things. You know, if someone's retiring and, and purchasing insurance on the open market, eight thousand dollars is not going to cover a year's worth of premiums. If they so choose, they could take $8,000 as a cash payment, but then it would be taxable. The, the direct payment to an HRA, a health reimbursement account, um, would, would be uh, tax exempt. So the, if, if an employee was retiring, and had a spouse that was still working and had, you could go to the family insurance plan of the spouse, we can roll that over so they would not have to spend that $8,000 out. They could let that sit for three years and have $24,000 in that HRA account. So, I mean, there, there seems to be a lot, of, a lot of flexibility. I know when Liz was here, there was some un uncertainty whether there was a cap on how much could be rolled over. Um, the representative from DBS had shared with us that the school district can set all of those parameters up. How do you get to the savings amounts? If someone in, the, in that spreadsheet that was shared that there was somebody at the top of the pay scale with, and when they used actual employees, so somebody at the top of the pay scale with family insurance, Here's what they cost the district on a per year basis. If you if they retire, you're replacing that salary. And the actual comparison, I think there was only one brand new teacher. He missed it matched insurance is in the of experience. Students on uh, students, staff that were had a master's degree, and you know, so on a little bit higher pay scale, some that were maybe mid-level. And I think there was one new teacher. So based on insurance comparisons, there was going to be, there would be a cost savings per staff member. So potentially with replacing, with replacing all seven staff members and a payout, there could be potentially a savings of $160,000 in the first year. 
Then if you, was, I think they assumed a 7% insurance increase. Salary increase. Salary. So the next year, comparing those same same people, if if teacher A, if Mitch Wainwright was teacher A and stayed, what would it be in year two versus the new hire once a year in, in year two with a 7% increase in salary and a 3% on insurance? So that savings gets a little bit smaller from one year to the next. But over the course of three years, would be could potentially be three hundred thousand dollars if all seven of those staff members retired and were replaced with somewhere on that pay scale that was shared as a comparison. You're incentivized. Um, you talked about you mentioned DEI. You mentioned DBS as the as the provider of um, of the HRA HRA yep. option. Have we explored other options? Do we have an existing relationship with DBS? We do not. We use uh, Employee Benefits Corporation, EBC. They manage our flex. They do not provide this particular service. We'd reached out to them right away. I'd asked Liz to, if there was somebody that she knew that would be able to answer our questions around an HRA for retirees, uh, and she contacted DBS and set up the appointment for us. There, there probably are other providers. Um, we just, I was just trying to get as much information as quickly as I could without trying to get a price quote as to who we would go with. Liz is online, by the way. Do you have yeah. questions for him? So this fourteen hundred dollars per year is like an administrative fee to maintain the the retirement account, the health retirement account. Correct. They basically we. We could set it up <clears throat> as simply as we create a new account at Farmer Savings Bank. We transfer the money into the account at Farmer Savings Bank, provide DBS with everything. And from, from that point on, my business office does not have to worry anything. They're, they're, we don't answer questions. We don't answer paperwork. We're not doing it. They take care of everything else. And that's what the $1,400 would would provide for us that it's not us anymore having to deal with it. Those fees stop as soon as we stop adding money, like after the three years? Once, once um, the last employee is done using that okay. is when the fees would stop. Okay, so we would continue mm -hmm. to maintain the accounts even after we add money to it. Because you would, at a minimum... At a minimum, you would pay that over out over three years. So you'd have two thousand the first and fourteen for the next two years. If somebody, if somebody's buying insurance in the open market, they're going to go through their eight thousand dollars. If that's the number that's decided, they would go through that. And at the year of, at the end of year three, it's pretty much, pretty unlikely we would have to continue to pay that amount after three years. Unlikely it would be used up. But if if somebody's Spouse continues to work and they use their spouse's insurance. It, it could realistically go on for 10 years. And that suddenly becomes a very expensive option for us. Is that a possible scenario? It, all, it could be. It depends on how the district sets it up. You can allow the rollover to continue. Put a cap or we could that. put a cap. You could, you know, the district can put a cap on it and say, you know, we'll allow it to roll over for five years or whatever the case may be. But there, the district could decide and has the authority to decide on that. I was thinking that if they don't want it for insurance, like if they have their spouse's insurance, they're probably going to take the cash option. We offer that. Mm -hmm. What would be the incentive of putting all that in an account, especially if it was limited? I think that we would need to protect ourselves by putting a cap on it Just because at ten fourteen hundred dollars a year for ten years makes this make a lot less sense because you'll have possible possible okays things like that that I don't know. she's trying to answer your question oh. 
why would they use it even if they were on their spouse's insurance? Yeah. It'd be just to cover out of pocket costs. Right. Does so anyone have, I, I'm sorry. I, would, I think we should include the caps in the motion, don't you think? Um, as far as part of the package, if we were in agreement, I, I do. I think that we can't pass this without caps in place. Can, can we change that now? The second rate, because this is the second rate. No, this, no, no. Is, this we're voting on a this recommendation. A recommendation. Okay. Yeah, this. Okay. yeah, this is not a handbook or policy or any kind of change that needs two readings. So you could you could put forward a motion however you see fit. We would do this over three years was the thought. That was the proposal that came to the to both committee that joint committee meeting was that it was a three year commitment. It was like eight, eight the recommendation was eight thousand dollars a year for three years. We make the plan terminate after four years then. You could certainly set that up. You could certainly set up not to roll over more than four years or whatever. That the district has that ability to set that up. You would pay for four years. No, no, you, you would only be committing to three. The fourth year, you would have to pay if somebody were allowed to go for a fourth year. You would pay the that fourteen hundred dollars. So if we if we went with DBS, you'd pay fourteen hundred dollars for that fourth year. After that, what happens? This might be a question for Liz. What happens if we put a four-year cap on it and I haven't incurred enough medical expense during that four years to fully, to use my full uh, stockpile of money? Liz might be able to answer that, but I believe it's at that point in time, it's more like a use it or lose it. Yeah, you would design it that way. Uh, Liz, while you... Well, you're on. Uh, do you know if these are, we would pay these as claims are incurred or if we would have to fund it in advance? As claims are incurred. We don't pay. DBS is the one that takes care of all of it. So if we made a, if we said, if if the agreement was $1,000 or $8,000 or $80,000, that money would get transferred. But as in my, in my example, that money would get transferred to Farmer Savings Bank. At which point in time, if somebody goes and has a, a premium payment, they they submit that bill to DBS, DBS reimburses them. The school district is out of it at that point in time. It's now between that third party and the retiree. Well, then based on this, I would suggest um, if, if it's possible, I don't know with the retirement age, right? From active employees, then we have like a pass-through account where the money stays with us and it gets transferred as claims come in to pay. So we can, we hold on to the money until the claims actually come in. And that way at the end, we can keep whatever left when the plan doesn't, you know, when the plan ends, when the plan terminates. Yes, yeah, so and that's, they that's use what I was asking. It. HRAs are usually Exactly. Notional dollars, not real dollars. You set it up and you pay it as the claims come in. Uh, and then that way we'd be able to, if they don't use it, we get it back. Can we set it up that way? I I don't know if Liz knows it would be, it would be a matter of asking DBS, but then at, at that point in time, we don't need DBS. Well, no, because they, we need somebody who knows what's an eligible expense. I mean, just, yeah, you'd want to, they're going to keep you compliant. So if, you're always going to run an HRA through a, a third party. So Liz, do you know if, if because it's a, it can be funded as claims come in, could we just put the money in an account like a farmer's savings bank and then they pay it out as need be, but that stays kind of, uh, separate in this way, if there's anything left at the end, it would come back to the district. You know, if after the plan terminates, somebody didn't use it all, 
money would come back to the district? If that's how you want to set it up from the start, that's how they'll do it, yes. I think that's just wise. That's how you fund, when you offer flexible spending account, that's how you fund it on the money. That makes sense to me. We're still giving everybody an option of cash payout, at least as far as it stands now. So if that's just better for them and they want to keep it all and that's their priority, <laughs> they can do that. And if they anticipate high health care costs over those three years or four years, whatever we decide, then they can do that. And they're super healthy and they just don't use it. It was there. It was still a benefit. But then it would just come back to, to us to help do that future or do other things on prescriptions on the last. Yeah. Any thoughts, Mitch? But we don't have we don't have the details of how to set the plan up. It's a you know so all of these things can be factored yeah, in later. Yeah this right. this was just for application and my right. give my thoughts. Oh, much appreciated. Well, no, I mean, those are two important things that probably should be included in the motion. Okay. And you want to comment on that here? Well, I think, you know, in the motion, we also need to, to make it included in the motion that's a one-time. Yes. Okay. One-time offer. Yeah, one-time offer. Situation that we would like to help alleviate. You to clarify when the offer expires, or is it assuming that don't you have a, a resignation notification date in March? Yep. And would that be the deadline to qualify for this? Is that assumed, or does that need to be clarified? And what are some of the results? I think you want to put a motion in the way. I know we have talked about March first. The meeting was because that was, it used to be before Act Ten. Is that what you recommend, Mitch? Yes. Okay. Well, this would be for retirement eligible employees as of March, as of the next school year, provided they elect it on March 1st. Or as of the end of this school year, provided so they elect it. The March parameters 1st. we talked about in the committee meeting were um, the 25 years of service and a minimum age of 55. So an employee could technically be retirement right. eligible not. for other reasons, but not meet those two okay. thresholds that we had set in place for this conversation. Correct. And it would go into effect, was it July? Is that when the- July 1 would be the new fiscal year. So yes, it would into effect. Yeah, so it, somebody would be retiring from this current school year. And the payments, the, the benefit would kick into play then in the new fiscal year. So I would, I move that we offer the uh, retirement, I don't really want to call it exactly retirement. One-time retirement. One, one -time retirement benefit uh, to employees who reach the age of 55 and have worked in the district for at least 25 years, who elect to participate elect to retire by March 1st, 2023. They would notify, they would notify the district administrator by that date. They would retire effective at the end of the school year. The plan is scheduled to terminate March, or it would be July 1st, 2027. And any monies remaining in any funds would be returned to the district. And is $8,000 the dollar you want oh, to sorry. use? And, make, and the benefit amount is $8,000 per year over three four years. Three years. To be elected as in? Oh, at a, in a one time election on March 1st. As a cash benefit or as a HRA. 
Brian, right, make it, I think this is the second extremely long motion. <laughs> <laughs> Article two. Yeah, but I think it was a good idea to get it all included, so. Term expires when? Well, it's be 23 to 24, 24 to 25, 25 to 26, 26 to 27, July 1st. So June 30th. Or June 30th, thank you. Okay. Um, 2027. And it's eight thousand a year for three years for the next year. I second the motion. Any other discussion, comments? Um, I, I would reiterate two things. One, this is. Um, this is significant cost savings for the district at a time when we are looking for places for cost savings. Um, number two, during the committee meeting um, that hasn't been brought up here, we had quite extensive discussion of, on is this best for the school and the students? And will do we believe we'll be able to backfill the positions that will be vacated? And um, our administrators shared that they thought it they would be able to um, recruit and hire high quality teachers to backfill the opening so that our education system remains the best in the area. While we've been talking about the numbers, those things are still important and I didn't yes. want anybody, anybody listening or to this later on to think that we were just worried about the money. But we did take a holistic approach. Can I just say one thing? Am I allowed to say one thing? This Liz? Yes. Yep. Yeah, go ahead, Liz. You will have to determine, and I mean, it sounds like you kind of already know, but it will have to be decided if you want this to be for premium only or premium and out-of-pocket expenses. Oh, I, I think for premium, thank you, Liz, I think for premium and out-of-pocket expenses because we're also giving it as cash. So. Right, right. Yeah. Just thank making you, sure you all realize that. You're adding that in there, Angie. Premium and out of pocket. Correct. I think. Uh, I just want to say, I'm going to support this for a few reasons. Um, one is, um, I think this is, money aside, I think this is an important symbolic gesture to teachers who have dedicated the bulk of their careers, if not their entire careers, to Merrill Point. Um, because the in order, in order to be eligible, you have to have worked in the district at least 25 years. So I think that's a significant um, appreciation of loyalty to the district that I think is important. Um, I know it on the surface, it seems like an added expense, um, but as Joni was saying, and as it's been explained, um, you know, this this will create a if there's a retirement this will create a net savings to the district and a small amount of that will go back to this uh, we'll be able to pay for this benefit so um, not only does it not add to the budget but it would be um, a cost savings and if there is no retirement then there is no payment so um, I'm comfortable with that from a financial standpoint and the fact that it's a one-time offer, um, because we have a unique situation where we have a lot of teachers that are eligible and I don't want to speak for them, but I, I know that there are not only a lot of teachers, but there are a lot of people who work period longer than they want to simply to carry health insurance. And, uh, you know, as a physician, I see it all the time in the medical field, dealing with patients, um, you know, having to work an extra job just to carry the health insurance. And I'm sure everyone knows people who do the same thing um, or have, or, you know, are having to do the same thing. So <coughs> acknowledging that struggle in teachers who maybe want to retire, but, um, but don't um, simply to carry insurance for their family. Um, I think it's another benefit we can offer um, our staff. So I appreciate the, Finance Personnel Committee's administration. I know we met with our with our healthcare agent to come up with a plan 
uh, um, and you know, Mr. Austin, do uh, that made sense financially and um, you know, in, in all checked all the boxes. And I just want to make a comment. There was uh, we talked about it in the beginning of the meeting, but we received an anonymous letter from somebody who had uh, seen the minutes, I think, from the personnel and and uh, finance committee meeting. And their point that they made in the letter was that these people are going to retire anyway, so why are you incentivizing them to retire? And I just wanted to speak to that point in case it comes up and somebody's watching this video. I just borrow your matrix there. Thank you. So the ages, um, and we were talking about seven eligible people at the meeting, and, and now there's uh, we've discovered there's two more, so there's actually nine. And the ages were ranged from 56 to 62. So in, in theory, these people would keep working for maybe many years, you know, and and uh, and they're at the most of these people are at the top of the salary range. Um, so when you just look at the first year of cost savings by offering this, if all nine people were to retire, if it's a savings of two hundred sixteen thousand dollars, if we add in the extra two to the to the district. So in the, in the anonymous letter we got, it seemed like, well, why are you paying this money? It's an extra cost when you're talking about having financial problems. And I just wanted to really illuminate that, illustrate that, that it's actually a saving, potential savings of $216,000 to the district. I agree with, uh, my mother taught for over 30 years, I think 35 years. So I agree with the rest of the things that you've said about, about teachers and and supporting them and making this a good place to work. But I just like to put that idea to bed that we're just wasting money. Um, we're doing this as a, a pretty significant cost savings measure, assuming that people take us up on it. That's it. And I think one of the other sentiments that was addressed was that there were maybe people who retired recently who would have also liked to have had this. And in no way lessens our appreciation for them we're in a very specific financial situation right now where we need to do this now to save the money. Uh, so it's unfortunate we can't do it for everybody. We don't have the money to do it every year. This is a, a specific time where we need to really control our budget. It's a way to get the budget under control and show appreciation. At the same time. Any other comments, questions? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Gelding? Yes. Bush? Yes. Ferris? Yes. Eisner? Yes. Yes. Next is uh, athletic co-op renewals. We have four different sports that we need to renew our co-ops with the Dodgeville School District. Um, boys soccer, boys and girls cross country, and then gymnastics. We're in three co-op, and the, the gymnastics is actually a tri-op. The Iowa Grand School District is part of that agreement as well. Um, but we need to, for cross country, both cross country and soccer, we need to have board approval of those co-ops by February 1st of 2023. And we could bring back the gymnastics by April, but we're here and it's just one other it's, it's formality to have the approved. We have a lot of our students that participate in these sports, uh, great deal of success, great deal of team building, things that we couldn't offer necessarily on our own. So. None of these are new, and I would recommend that we that you approve these sports co-ops. Motion to approve the athletic co-op renewals. Second. Second. Yeah. Discussion. Do we, do we do spring? 
we we sub, we uh, approve spring at a different time. Yeah. Yes. There's, there's, okay. Uh, different deadlines for each season. Okay. And they're two-year agreements, correct? Yes. Yeah. So we might not have to worry about the track yeah, or girls' soccer, soccer or anything like that until might be a year from now that we're looking at those sports. Do you have these printed offers? I just have them in the board. I don't have them anywhere else. Interesting. District administrator signature. Oh, it's just yours? And then mine. And sorry. Yeah, it could just be, sorry, board president and the district administrator. Mm -hmm. I just want to underscore the value of these co-op sports and just um, <coughs> this is the nature of being in a small school where sometimes you can't field your own team for a sport that some kids really like to play. And I really want to just show appreciation for the Dodgeville and IR Grant School Districts for agreeing to co-op with us and give these kids opportunity. Anyone else before we vote? Building? Yes. Yes. Harris? Yes. Eisner? Yes. Janetka? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Yes. Thank you. There's a lot of good relationships that have developed over the years. Well, a lot of credit to you for making it happen, Vicki. Seriously. Uh, should we go to business services? Yes. Okay. Unless you have any comments off of that, Mitch, I'll take a motion to approve credit card statement of activity and uh, accounts payable, either together or separately. I'll move to approve them together. Second. Harris, Janetka. Any comments, questions? Just one quick question. We, like, when do we use the report points? Do we just save those up? Um, we're probably to the point where we should claim them. Um, and that basically pays a payment, you know, of that nature. So we're probably at that time where we should use that on, on the credit card <laughs> side. Miss Dr. Lindsay, he's usually the one that asks that question. <laughs> the uh, bid payments and the set purchases is that out of the same fund? For like the musical, there is uh, extra duty contract for some for some right. those things so yes so yeah there would be some but the, the pin isn't like we do like i understand we have the extra duty contracts but we've got these additional expenses on here and like verifying that's coming out of the same account that the ticket sales revenue goes into to, to answer that the, the answer to that would be no just like our coaches pay doesn't come out of the Ticket sales for a game, that money goes into back into the general account. But we budget for, you know, it's just like we budget for a head football coach. We budget for the musical director. We budget for the pit conductor. So, yes, we do have that budget. And we have the other positions on the extra duty contract. And all that we, yeah, yeah but those things. fantastic that we're able to give those people something. Yep. Yeah. Okay, any other comments or questions? Joni, you put something together over there? Nope, I am, I am on board. Harris? Yes. Eisner? Yes. Vinetka? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Felding? Yes. Yes. Done. Yes. Okay, I'll take a motion to convene the closed session. We'll discuss the uh, Superintendent evaluation. Move we convene in closed session. 
Yes. 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 Yes.